there and welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I am so excited for today's guest. Great conversations start with Christine Tate books. So let's meet Christine Tate. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for having me on your program. I'm so excited. I have so many things I want to talk about today, and I want to give you an opportunity to just kind of start by telling the readers, our viewers, a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Christine Tate, and I'm a stay-at-home wife. My husband spent 30 years in the Navy. I homeschooled our daughter, and I am the author of the No Homework with this Bible Study Group Hug series, as well as another book on prophecy, Are We the Terminal Generation? Plus, I actually have a prayer journal out as well. So I, uh, Christian nonfiction is my specialty. Nice. I like that. Now, I do understand that you have had some experience as a um, either a speaking or a guest at like a con or a book fair. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, from 2014 to 2020, I produced the Christian Readers and Authors Festival in Virginia Beach, where it was a festival designed for Christian authors to have a, an outlet to show the world their work, and as well as readers to come and hear enlightening seminars from authors talk about concepts that are applicable to Christians and issues that pertain to the Christian lifestyle. So I not only produced it, but I also did some speaking at the event. And I also mentor other authors for uh, bringing their works to publication. You know, it's, it's a, a learning curve and uh, I'm a self-published author. And when I started the whole process of writing, I had a huge learning curve trying to figure out, am I gonna self-publish? Do I want to do a traditional publishing contract? Are we looking at a hybrid situation? What's the difference between all of those? So, right. Uh, now that I'm on the other end of the spectrum, I mentor other authors through the process and educate to help others have an easier path with the learning curve than I did. That is so wonderful. I love all of that. I love the idea of, you know, helping new authors kind of um, take a path that you've previously taken so you can kind of guide them through that. But I'm going to be honest with you. The thing that I am like just kind of geeking out about is the fact that you produced a, a reader a reader slash writer conference like that's my dream like that's what <laughs> I hope Lit Carnival will be one day so I think that's amazing that you've done that well I'm, I'm thinking about resurrecting it the only reason I stopped in 2020 was because of the globe shut down for COVID as we all right. know and I'm thinking it may be time to bring it back uh, to life and I've had some interest from people asking me, is it coming back? When are you doing the next one? So you and I are definitely gonna have to touch base on that. Definitely. I would love to, you know, participate, be a part of it any way I can. That sounds fascinating to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to move into the first segment of the show. I have it broken up into segments. And so the first part is what I call on the bookshelf. And so this is where I get to kind of get to know you as the reader. I feel like anyone who writes, whether they publish or not, probably, not always, but probably started out as a reader first. So I have mm -hmm. a few reader questions I'd like to ask. Okay, let's have them. All right, so what are you currently reading? Uh, actually, a book called The Liver Cure. So I, I, a passion of mine is alternative health. I love gardening and uh, anything holistic. I think we're first and foremost responsible for our own health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And I think that natural, um, natural diseases, if you will, that come on organically require organic solutions. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't think there's definitely a time and a place for a doctor, but <laughs> I absolutely prefer to do things that are more natural in nature. And uh, I think, you know, a, a women of a certain age or men of a certain age, you know, they kind of need to do a little spring cleaning in their bodies. So exactly. uh, I'm actually reading a book about how to clean the old house out for a little bit. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's I definitely agree that um, there is a, you know, a time and a place for, you know, medicine and science and everything, but there's a lot of things that happen in nature that you can combat that with nature. So I love that. All right. Uh, let's see. Have you read any of what are considered the classics, you know, the things that they say that everyone should read at some point? And if you have read one of the classics, which one did you like? 
Well, I would have to go all the way back for high school for that. <laughs> uh, we read a lot of the classics when I was in high school, and I'd have to say I liked Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Yeah. They're very rich point. characters, a um, lot of intrigue. It just, it just developed really well, so as far as fiction like that. But to be honest with you, I'm not much into reading the books that people should read or they consider great classics. I think, um, like like with movies, for example, I love the Rotten Tomatoes. I really think that the movies that have the high Rotten Tomatoes at the critics' pan, they're the ones that are usually the best, most entertaining, enjoyable yeah. to watch. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm like that too. I mean, I I I'm I consider myself a reading advocate, so I'm the person who's out there telling you. You don't have to read what everyone tells you to read. Find something that interests you and read that. It's okay if the critics aren't praising it. If it calls to you, if it speaks to you, read it, you know? And I do well, uh, Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of times um, people aren't sure what to write. And the advice that I give them is write the type of genre that you enjoy reading. Yeah. So. I enjoy just when I'm relaxing and, and choosing it, not a high school teacher telling me to read it. <laughs> I prefer self-improvement, nonfiction, and Christian literature. So, you know, for me, if that's what I enjoy reading in my free time, then that's what I also enjoy writing. And I found that to be very true. So, yeah. you know, somebody who loves to read romance novels, try your hand at being a romance novel writer. Yeah. You know, make that connection there because if you have that passion for it, it's going to come through in your writing. Yes, I definitely agree with that. If it, you're going to be writing something, it, you should enjoy it. And especially if it's something that you've read before, you're going to have that experience that you had from reading it carry over into your writing. I love that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the last question that I have for On the Bookshelf, this is one of my favorite questions. I wish I could ask everyone this question, but I try to rotate them. But I want you to think back to those days of youth and what was your favorite book when you were a kid? <laughs> okay, so this doesn't really fit with the whole Christian self-help genre, <laughs> but <laughs> when I was a teen, I, I could not get enough of V.C. Andrews. I, I don't know <laughs> what it was about that series, but I read every book V.C. Andrews ever wrote. And when uh, Flowers in the Attic, the movie came out, I don't think it did nearly justice to the book it just didn't do it justice yeah because the books cannot be pinpointed to a particular time and it's really interesting when you read them because it's almost like a mystery trying to figure out what the time setting for the book is you know normally when you read a book you can figure out okay this is turn of the century you know this is you know modern you know current day this is a futuristic type book but if you read flowers in the attic which is the very first book that vc andrews wrote you cannot pinpoint the timeline. And when they made the movie, they tried to make the movie without the benefit of a timeline to it. And it, it just came out really bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that by not having an identifiable timeline in the books, it actually gives the reader more freedom to imagine the timelines and character styles that appeal to them the most. So it brings the reader further in, and I just, I love that technique. Yeah, I, I agree with that because it's I feel like it's one of those things where there don't get me wrong, there are times when having a very clear setting will add to the story. But like you said, with the story like that, by not having that be so definitive, who's ever reading it can imagine it happening in any time that appeals to them. And it's such a <laughs> I use this word a lot, I overuse it, but it's such a crazy story that <laughs> You being able to imagine it in any time could, you know, it's just going to add to your experience of reading that story. Mm -hmm. All right. So that was on the bookshelf. Now we're going to switch gears and go to what I call the open book. And this is where I get to talk to you a little bit about you as a writer. Um, I love connecting with other writers and finding about maybe like their processes and things like that. I pick up tips sometimes. I find out things that maybe don't work for me, but I could try them, you never know. So you ready for it? Let's have it, bring it on. All right, so this is one that I love to find out is how do you write? Are you gonna do pen and paper old school? Are you doing technology all the way computer or is it a mixture of both? Well, primarily is digital. I'm a fast typist and I think faster than I can write with a pen. So for me to try to sit down and 
do something old school with pen and paper, it just doesn't work. But if I'm thinking, my fingers can keep up with the keyboard as far as my thoughts go. So for me, that allows for a seamless brain dump. And I almost get frustrated when I have to sit there with a pen and paper because my hand is trying to catch up to my brain at that point. So it's definitely as much digital as possible. However, I will say that uh, thoughts come to me at the oddest times and I always have a pen and paper on hand and I will jot a note. And if you were to come over to my home, you would see scraps and scribbles and notes just kind of wait, that's got to get integrated in and that's got to get integrated in. And then when I sit down for my writing time, I kind of put all the pull all those notes together and then integrate them as I write on the computer. So that very much digital for me. Yeah, I, I'm a digital girl all the way too, but I'm like you, I've got little notes here and there. Actually, <laughs> my problem is that I will purchase <laughs> full on notebooks and then I'll have like two or three pages and each of those notebooks just spread out <laughs> throughout the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, and because of my, my genre, Christian nonfiction, a lot of the material that I come up with is what God's working on through me in my own life. So this isn't just sitting down going, what do I feel like writing about? It's, okay, God, what are you dealing with me with? Yeah. And then what's my lesson I'm learning from this? Okay, that's all right. Well, you know what? I could share this with somebody and then maybe somebody else will benefit from this lesson without having to go through the hard knocks that I've already been through to get the lesson. So, you know, for me, again, I mean, it's, it's life lessons. It's, it's what's happening in my life as I live life. And there's not always a computer keyboard around. So again, that goes back to the random notes going, all right, I get it. That was a lesson that's got to go in the book. Yeah. I like that. Capturing those moments as you know, God is working through you. I love that. So let's see what else I have here. Oh, yes, this is a fun question. So um, do you consider yourself a plotter, a pantser, or somewhere in between? Are you familiar with those terms? Uh, are you talking about how quickly I write and, and what I do? So let me, so yeah, this was a term that I found out about mm, maybe five or six years ago. Okay. So plotters are people who will typically outline whatever it is they're writing before they start their writing process. And a pantser is usually someone who will just start the writing process without outlining first. And so are you a plotter or do you outline first? Oh, or I am definitely a, a, a planter, you said? So a plotter or a pantser, the pantser is the panther. one who starts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely a panther, definitely. Okay. So um, I'll sit down and I'm fairly good at organizing material in my head as I go. Okay. So it's, it, there's almost a running outline in my head. So for me, it's kind of redundant to write it down and then rework it for there. So I absolutely a panther. Yeah, that's, you know, and that's what I've heard. Like, I'm actually a plotter. And so when I talk to some of my friends who aren't plotters and they tell me, well, yeah, I've got the outline in my head. And for me, I'm like, but I can't visually see it, but it works for them. So right. I always encourage people, do what works for you. Mm -hmm. All right. And so the last thing that I have, this is a question that I don't ask as much, but every now and then it just seems to be the right question to ask. And so I'm excited to hear what your answer is going to be. Um, everyone has different reasons and motivations for what they do. And so my question is for you, what is your ultimate goal as a writer? Well, ultimately, I'd like to help people apply the word of Christ to their life in a very biblically applied scriptural way. So it's one thing to read scripture. It's another to actually apply it in your life. And I tend to write where I see the need. So for example, I didn't get called to writing because I wanted to be a writer. I got called to writing because I saw the need and I tried to meet the need. So we were military and attending a military church. And at a base church, you have a very high turnover of the congregation. Mm -hmm. People are rotating in, people are rotating out. You don't have the stability for the congregation that a civilian church has. So a lot of the women there didn't really know each other. We were starting a new Bible study and we got together, said, hey, what do you guys want to do? And I kind of had an idea, but I wanted everybody to kind of find their suggestions and vote on them. So nobody really had any ideas. So I said, look, everybody go home get your choices together. And then next week we'll vote on them and whatever we decide to do, we'll do. Well, the next week we got together and nobody had found anything they wanted to do, but I had a concept for what would be a, a good way to start off a small group. So I said, you know what? I got an idea. Let me just 
put a lesson together, I'll get us going. So I actually wrote group hug one for our group. So for the next eight weeks, we did what I wrote for the group. And at the end of the group, everybody was very complimentary. Um, but then again, it's a women's Bible study. I mean, I didn't know if they actually liked it or if it was like, okay, thank you for the effort. Right. You know, we appreciate it, but let's go do something else here. Yeah. So um, then we went on, we did another uh, series by a different author, another eight week study. And at the end of that, they turned to me and said, we really liked yours a lot better. Would you write us another one? So that's kind of when I knew, you know, I actually had something there and I thought, you know what, if it helps these women, maybe I can help other women too. And then that's how the No Homework Women's Bible Study Group Hug got started. So I love that story. I mean, it's anytime um, things just kind of happen organically where you're feeling a need to me though that's like the best situation to be in I mean of course there's nothing wrong with having aspirations and wanting to be a writer but to know that this all came about just because you were feeling a need like that speaks to my heart I love that thank you and then also uh, throughout this series I run focus groups and I test the lessons so and it's the funniest stuff that comes out you know theology theologically speaking everything's usually fine but it's the oddest thing. So I do icebreakers. I'll give you a perfect example. So okay. I'm left-handed and I tend to see the world reverse from most people. We live in a right-handed world and mm -hmm. where, where somebody may go right to left, my natural inclination would be good to go left to right. So I had an icebreaker and the women in the focus group had to uh, number something from one to 10 with, I think it was like one being the most and 10 being the least. And I was watching the group do it do their numbering. And I saw every single woman at the same point kind of stop, pause, like they were a little bit confused. And when I asked the group about that after the focus group was over, they said, well, it just seemed backwards to us. Okay, <laughs> mental note to self, go home, reverse the numbering scale. So you know, little things like that. Or, you know, there was a, another icebreaker that I was doing where um, you were to turn and put, lay your hand on the woman's arm next to you and proclaim a blessing over her. I think the topic that week was blessings. Mm -hmm. And you go around the circle with each person issuing a blessing over the woman sitting to their right. And it was going great until we got about halfway around the circle when one woman visibly, I mean, this was literal way possible, jumped out of her seat, actually physically jumped up, back and out of her seats and threw her hands up in the air and screamed, don't touch me. <laughs> and we were all kind of sitting there. I don't think anybody really knew what to make of it. And she kind of realized she had overreacted. And, and she said, well, I just, I just have space issues. I'm like, okay, not a problem. Okay. And, you know, we, we don't, she doesn't have to touch you. You know, we can skip and go around. But, you know, mental note to self, go edit out the part where I tell people to touch each other. You know, just <laughs> raise your hand and proclaim. Them. So, you know, the focus groups really helped me fine tune the, the workbook part of it because, the Bible studies that I write are interactive. They're discussion based. They're they're designed to generate conversation. And you know, it's not just something where you take a book to the beach and you know you read it for two hours. So in generating that, you need to make sure that you've got a seamless flow. I like that. Very nice. Um, I, I I love the fact that you know that your goal in writing is to use that to. Um, you know, connect people with, you know, the, the calling from God. So the, I love that. Um, it's funny, this is actually like the perfect segue into the next uh, segment of the show, which is called a book signing. And this is where I ask you questions specifically about your work. And oddly enough, <laughs> my <laughs> first question was going to be how you came up with the idea for your Bible study. So we've <laughs> already got that one out the way. <laughs> okay. But I do want to ask that same question, since I know you have another book, which is you have an active like discussion group for it on uh, Facebook, and I believe it's called "We Are the Terminal Generation." Is that correct? Are we the Terminal Generation? Yes. Are we the Terminal Generation? Yes, yes. Yes. Why don't you tell us where the idea for that came from? Okay, so it's also a Bible study, but it's not part of the group hug series. The group hug series is eight week books uh, in in succession of each other. Similar format, but this is actually a 25 week study of prophecy. Now, here's where I, I came up with that. And I, I'm not trying to offend any of your listeners. So, um, you know, if you're listening, um, please take this with a grain of salt. I personally don't believe the timing of the rapture is pre trip. 
And I think there's extensive scriptural evidence that pokes a lot of holes in the pre-trib theory. And with that, I realized there's nothing on the market that really addresses, well, what are, what is the relationship between pre-trib and post-trib? And wait a minute, I think we're getting a little closer because I'm starting to see some things happening that, you know, global shutdown of the pandemic, you know, things that have just never happened before. Um, you know, the, the supply chain disruptions and the, you know, the inflation that's starting to exceed regular inflation and has hints of maybe hyperinflation coming along. I mean, there's a lot of things in our society that uh, are starting to happen, which not to say that there haven't been haven't been inflation before there has it's the level of the inflation okay it's the supply chain disruptions you know yes you may have a shipment that doesn't come in but you don't have the entire chain disintegrating yeah. you know we've, we've had you know different mini pandemics where it's a bad flu season but you don't have the globe shut down because of a pandemic so you know we're, we're starting to see things happen that indicate things are on a different level than they have been. And I kind of combine that with my frustration. And it was a frustration that there's just not a lot written out there saying, hey, here's here's the post-trib rapture timing position that kind of integrates that into where we're at with prophecy. So I actually explore prophecy from the perspective of how does the pre-trib and post-trib rapture argument compare and what are the signs of our time and the terminal generation is the generation which will be alive at the time that Jesus returns. Are we that generation or is it another generation? You know, if we are that generation, there should be signs. What signs are we looking for? You know, let's delve into that. Let's let's evaluate that. So uh, it can be read independently as a standalone book, just for thinking mm -hmm. or uh, and personal edification, or it can be done as a group, very similar to group hug, but it is 25 weeks long. Okay. So after like hearing you, you know, describe like where the idea came from and kind of the essence of, of what the book um, discusses, um, it, it, it does, the, you picked the perfect title for it. Um, so I'm wondering if, since you did mention that it could be read as a group or standalone, does it have um, like questions or like exercises that you follow from like week to week or is that all of that at the end? No, it is very similar to the group hug format where there is a commentary, which again, you can, if you're doing it independently and not as a group, you can read the commentary. And then there's a word study where I take a verse that relates to the topic hand and we look at the Greek or the Hebrew origin of the word. So that adds more depth to the concept at hand. Again, not something that has to be done in a group. Then there are some discussion questions, but there are also self-exploration questions as well. So if you didn't have a group to discuss them with, you could answer them for yourself and just kind of think through, does this make sense? How do I feel about that? What's my position? You know, kind of analyze what was discussed in the commentary. Then there's some optional personal challenges, which again, you don't need a group. And, and I call them optional. There's never any work in anything that I write. But if you want to kind of pull the concept through the week, there's some things that can help you think through the concept on more tangible level as you go throughout your week. And then there's a, a closing prayer, which again, you know, you can, you can pray by yourself. You don't have to pray in a group. So, you know, other than the icebreaker, which is meant to be done in a group, but it really, if you take that piece out of it, the rest of the lesson can absolutely be done just as, as an individual thinking through the process and, you know, being educated on prophecy. I like that. I like that you, kind of design that in mind so that it would fit into either of those dynamics, whether it's someone who just wants to kind of, you know, study and delve into that on an intimate personal level, um, but also will suit someone who wants to have a group around them as they're contemplating these things and praying through them. So I, I like that you designed it that way. Thank you. And so um, so that, that question was actually the, the second question. But so the, the next question that I have is because I know that um, you're doing like these devotionals, these nonfiction kind of um, study guides, um, do you have any like ultimate like plans for the current series that you have? Or do you maybe have another um, Bible study series in the works in the future? 
Oh, ideas are something I'm not short of. <laughs> so I am actually working on a process. Uh, it's a, a Christian's guide for a surviving divorce. And it's a 365 day devotional. So I personally have not been divorced, but my mother ended up getting divorced after 50 years of marriage for infidelity reasons. So biblically sanctioned. And uh, I was trying to coach her through the process and realize that there's just not a lot out there from a Christian perspective. There's a, a lot of material on recovering from divorce, but not specifically from a biblical standpoint. Right. So as I was mentoring her through her process and helping her heal and process what was happening, I was actually turning each of the topics we were covering into a devotional. So I have a devotion, 365 day devotional uh, that should be coming out you know, sometime in the, I'm just going to say the future. I'm, I can't really give you a timeline at this point. Gotcha. And uh, there's some other concepts I have. For example, uh, are we the terminal generation is the opening salvo for let's talk about prophecy. But I really think the study of prophecy is pointless if you don't turn it into something applicable in your life. So if you answer the question, are we the terminal generation? and your answer is yes, and for the record, I think the answer is yes, then the next question becomes, what do we do about it? Okay. All right. I mean, it's not enough to say, yep, that's us. Well, why did God give us all these clues? What are we supposed to do with this information? And if you believe in the timing of a post-trib rapture, which again, there's, I know a lot of people are going to go, no, 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 it's pre-trib, we're out of here. And I'm not trying to insult any of those readers, but there is absolutely an argument that refutes a lot of the pre-trib points. And, you know, I would just encourage them to look, it's not a salvation issue. You know, we don't have to agree on it. And, you know, if whichever one of us is right, whenever we get to heaven, we can buy the other one uh, or the other one can buy us a smoothie from the tree of life. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm not trying to turn this into a, a controversial issue, but you know, I do believe that we're the terminal generation. I also believe that the timing of the rapture belongs at the end of the tribulation, not the beginning of the tribulation. As such, what do we need to be doing on a concrete level to prepare for that? So in answer to your question, I'm actually working on a book called Independence in the Suburbs, where it's similar to the Facebook group that I have. So just so that your readers know, there is a Facebook group called Are We the Terminal Generation? Uh, there's there's the book page and there's the discussion group. I'm specifically talking about the discussion group where I actively post uh, prophecy headlines in the news that relate to prophecy. And I give practical tips for basic preparedness, storage tips, just anything that's practical, tangible knowledge and advice. And the group discusses it and, and brings our own unique knowledge to the discussion. So it's an active preparedness group. But anyway, so with that, uh, I'm working on a book called Independence in the Suburbs because there's a lot of people that as much as they love the idea of, you know, 40 acres and a mule, you know, I'm going to move out to the country. I'm going to live off grid. I'm going to have, you know, um, grow a garden and, you know, never have to go in another store again. The reality is there's a lot of wonderful Christian people with a heart for the Lord and it's just not in their future. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm in that boat, you know, as much as I love that idea, we live in the suburbs. We're not going to be moving from the suburbs. It's not feasible for us. So, you know, does that mean that there's nothing we can do? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. There's a lot we can do, but it does have to be tailored. I can't go buy a cow and have fresh milk in the backyard. Okay. Right. <laughs> all right. And in terms of a garden, I, I have a suburban backyard. I can't have a half acre to grow corn and, you know, my own wheat. I mean, you know, you got to be strategic about how you you grow food and what you do and store things and so it is so independence in the suburbs is the concrete practical application for christians living in urban and suburban environments as a follow-up to are we the terminal generation yes well then what are we going to do about that nice i mean you definitely sound like you have a solid plan your reasoning behind everything that you're doing I love the reasoning behind it. And just with everything that you were saying, I did like the one um, thing that you stated, which isn't necessarily about the book itself, but you were kind of explaining how people are going to have differing opinions about this. And you're like, it's not a salvation issue. And I love that you said that because this, when I do this 
interviewing with different people. I'm doing it, exposing people to different things. Not a lot of judgment there. I don't hide what my views are, but I do love that you stated that so that people understand that um, you can't have, you know, these discussions and look into things without it being an issue of your salvation. Well, and, and I think in our society, one of the things that's been lost, and this is across the board, not just with Christianity, I'll, I'll expand the umbrella very wide on this point. I think we have lost the art of discussion and debate. And it's turned into, and it doesn't matter what the topic is. We could be talking about prophecy, we could be talking about religion, we could be talking about politics, we could be talking about pronouns, it doesn't matter. But everything in our society has become so I'm right, this is the way it is, you're wrong, we're gonna fight about it. Yeah. And I, we all just need to stop, step back and say, what is the other person really trying to say? Is there a valid point there? Mm -hmm. Listen to what the other person is saying, then evaluate, is there merit to what was said? If there is merit, then we need to take that merit on board and not just dismiss it. And if there's not merit in what the other person is saying, then in a loving and friendly manner, we need to have a discussion about well, hey, have you thought about this? And here's my counterpoint to what you're thinking. So then, you know, where does that take us? You know, what do you think about that? And have these open, friendly discussions that don't turn into these um, almost, you know, control-oriented conflicts where everybody just has to be right. Nobody's listening to anybody. And there's no rational debate and discussion happening. Yeah. So again... Your work, I don't even need to repeat them, what you just said, though. I loved that. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, it definitely um, is inspiring me to um, check out some of your um, work because I'm just, I mean, obviously I was already interested in the topics, but just hearing you speak just just makes me more excited about um, well, thank you. your work. So we are going to shift gears. We're gonna lighten things up. This is what I call the silly section of the interview process. And this is where I just have some bunch, bunch of fun questions that I like to just throw out there and see what we get. Okay. All right. So if you could only pick one, you can only pick one, <laughs> which would you have? Cake, pie, or candy? Mm, that's a tough one. Oh, I'm gonna, I, okay. All right. So I'm not much of a pie eater, so that's an easy one to toss out. Okay. The cake and the candy are kind of a split. I'm going to have to go candy because the variety is just there with the candy. You know, some days it's a Reese's day and other days it's a Milky Way day. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, cake is more limited in chocolate, vanilla. Um, you know, those are your main ones. Uh, obviously, there's some fan angel food cake out there. But, you know, I like the variety that candy offers. So I'm going to go with candy on that one. I love your choice. I would normally pick cake, except for one thing. I'm one of those people who I like, like fresh baked cake. So I don't want something that's been baked and sitting on a shelf for a long time. So, But it's the opposite with candy because all of your candy is like made ahead of time. So just like you for the variety, I think I'd go with candy. <laughs> well, it's got that texture to it. You know, you again, the variety, you know, you got the squishy soft, but what if you're going to make like a hard, you know, hard sucker or you just really want to chew something to death and you got to have that piece of gum you know? yeah <laughs> all right um do you sing in the shower why or why not okay so i am not a singer at all <laughs> and i i don't have the voice for it nobody wants to hear me sing and i would much rather listen to somebody actually make good music and i i don't know a lot of songs but there are rare times where I sing and I love, 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 love music from the, the 60s and 70s is, is that's what I'm all about to the point where when I had my daughter, I just couldn't bring myself to sing lullabies to her. <laughs> so my daughter's uh, sleeping songs when I was rocking her to sleep were John Denver's uh, Take Me Home Country Roads and Delta Dawn. So uh, she could probably <laughs> sing those in her sleep now she's heard them so many times yeah i remember um when my niece and i think i think even my nephews too but when they were babies there was a song that elvis sang that's not really a lullaby but that's what we would sing to them <laughs> as a lullaby and even to this day they'll be like sing the sing our baby song and, and it's an elvis song yep <laughs> all right one more fun question to roll things okay. out 
how would you, um, if you could plan your dream, no, like don't worry about money or anything like that, dream vacation, what does that look like? Well, first of all, I love cruises because it's uh, kind of a lazy way to travel. You're not constantly flying and unpacking and repacking and getting to the airport and moving on to another leg. So my dream vacation would be long for one thing. It wouldn't be just a short trip. So if it's going to be long, I'm going to be seeing, again, I'm all about variety. I like different and <laughs> new. And uh, I'm, I'm not a thrill seeker. You'll never catch me bungee jumping or zip climbing, <laughs> but I do like my variety. So when I travel, I want to see a ton of different things. I want to do a, just everything. So there's going to be a lot of activities and it's going to be long, but I don't want to have to constantly be packing, repacking, hopping a flight, getting there, get the rental car, return the rental car. Right. So, you know, where are we going to eat tonight? So cruises are great for that. And I'd love to do a world cruise because again, for variety, yeah. you know, why choose just one place, you know, uh, just to hit them all and hit the highlights in each port. You know, it, you, I have to say this. Um, I am not, I have in the past, I have not been a big fan of cruises, but I've never had anyone describe the cruise the way you just did. And so now I'm rethinking, maybe there is something to this whole cruise. You don't have to unpack and repack. You just kind of, you know, go for the cruise. Like, hmm, I'm rethinking this now. <laughs> well, I, I got married when I was 30. So it was a little bit later in life and I had never taken a cruise. Well, my husband was Navy. And I thought, you know, if I'm marrying a man who spends a lot of time on ships, I'm kind of curious what it's like to be on a ship. Mm -hmm. So for our honeymoon, we took a cruise to Alaska. And that was when I realized I love cruising. <laughs> so it's a lot, a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, I would say the, the Alaskan cruise is the one that I've heard, like, if you like cruising, that's the one you should take. So it's on my bucket list. I have to just work up the nerve to try it, but that sounds heavenly. <laughs> it's beautiful. There was only one disappointment the entire cruise. I had it in my head that I really wanted to go dog sledding, except it never dawned on me that Alaska doesn't have snow year round. And we got married at the end of April. So when we went on our cruise, the dog sleds weren't sledding. It was, it was spring, summer in Alaska. So now it's on my bucket list. I need to go back and do Alaska during the cold months and we need to pick up that dog sled I never got, got to do. Well, I hope you get that dog sledding trip and I hope it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. You can come with me. We'll make it a, we'll make it a fun time. Yes. That would be so much fun. <laughs> All right. So we have come to the end. I've had so much fun today. Thank you for being with us today, Christine. And what I want you to do now is just kind of tell our viewers where they can find you or your work online. And I understand you have a special treat for our viewers. I do. Thank you. So uh, all of my work is available on Amazon. So you can just go to Amazon in the search bar, the No Homework Women's Bible Study Group Hug by Christine Tate, Are We the Terminal Generation by Christine Tate. There's My Prayer Journal, Remembering God's Answers by Christine Tate. And you'll find all of my books there. Uh, today, I have a special treat for your readers because I am going to make Are We the Terminal Generation free as the ebook from June 23rd to June 27th. So if you want to go to Amazon and download it as a free Kindle ebook on those dates, June 23rd to June 27th, then uh, everybody can get a free copy of it and, you know, see what they think and, and make sure you let me know uh, what you think of it. I, I love to hear from my readers. And if anybody's got questions or something that, you know, they want more clarification on, I am perfectly happy to talk prophecy all day long because it's my favorite subject. Fantastic. I'm very much excited about the download for the book and um, just kind of checking out your work all together. So that is all we have for today. I want everyone to stick around because I have some fun stuff that's going to be in the credits, especially my Patreon supporters stick around because Christine's got something special just for you guys. So until next time, everyone stay safe, be blessed and have fun reading. Bye. It's great talking to you. <laughs>